This podcast is brought to you by the American Enterprise Institute. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, review, and share. Thanks for listening. Here's our show. What the hell's going on? What the hell is going on? What the hell is going on? I don't know what the hell he's talking about. You don't have to know what the hell is on it. What the hell's the matter with these guys? We don't know what's going on. What the hell's going on? Who in God's name knows what it's all about? Hello, I'm Danielle Pletka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell is going on? What the hell is going on <laughs> is we are here, as in the old, uh, old 70s days, and like happy days, live before a studio audience. We're celebrating our 250th episode of this podcast, which means our listeners have enjoyed 250 hours of you and I bickering over yeah. the last few years. It's worse than being married, and your wife is in the audience, so Maybe. she can attest to that. <laughs> But it's wonderful to have everybody here, and we are thrilled. Mark and I have been friends for a very long time. I won't say how long, but it has been such a pleasure for us to be able to spend time, not just together, but with our guests and with our audience, uh, talking about, I mean, I've learned so much. Oh my gosh. I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a foreign policy person. You write about everything in the Washington Post, but you know, your background is in the foreign policy stuff yep. and in the politics as well. We've done everything, energy policy, politics, and more politics. The war here, the war there. You've done amazing work on Ukraine. Jack Keane, one of our repeat guests. Mike yeah. Gallagher leaving Congress, probably not because to be of out. Us. Because of us, probably. So we stop asking him to be on the podcast. It, it, we won't. <laughs> But what are we talking about today? Well, we're talking about uh, the rematch that everybody has been hoping for. Oh, yes. Yes. It's not, <laughs> not just the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. Yeah, not just us. Uh, it's uh, the rematch between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So let's, let's just set, set the stage for, uh, for our conversation. So Joe Biden, if you look at the 538 average, is the most unpopular president in the history of presidential polling. Uh, going all the way back to Harry Truman, which is in, when the modern polling era started. He is, at this point, he's, he's surpassed the previous record holder, Donald J. Trump, who is his, who is his opponent. He worked uh, hard during that. On, on, at this point in the 2020 election, he is twice as unpopular as Trump was at this point in, in his presidency going into his re-election. 43% plurality of Americans say that Joe Biden's policies have made them personally worse off. Only 18% say they've made him better. Double-digit disapproval on every single issue uh, that voters say they care about. 86% uh, say Biden is too old for another term. And so I went to the Real P Clear Politics page today to see what, what's the race look like. And a couple of days ago, I was on Fox and I was bringing, making some of these points. And I looked and I said it was separated by 1.1 points in the RCP average. I checked today, 0 0.2 points. It is a tie. So Donald, to the bottom. Trump, Donald Trump is, t is in a statistical tie with the most unpopular president in the history of the country. So... What that means is Americans are being asked to choose between two candidates they don't like and don't want, and they're going to have to pick one. <laughs> well, no, they've got RFK. They've got a few other outstanding choices. They've got, you know, an anti-Semite, a lunatic, an anti-vaxxer. It's great. It's a, it's a wealth of choices. The, the thing that I keep coming back to, and I'm, I'm going to want to talk to our guests about this as well, but the thing I keep coming back to is the statistic that uh, I think a lot of us cite when we talk about the election, which is that 65% of Americans didn't want to see a rematch. I have such a hard time understanding how we got through the primary process with 65% of Americans not wanting to see a rematch of 2020. And nonetheless, we have a rematch of 2020 with two people who are genuinely disliked, mistrusted. You've got one president who, who is, is obviously elderly and infirm, another one who, I'm not going to quote Joe Biden's uh, gridiron speech here, but another one who has 91 indictments against him. But that's one of the reasons why he's the nominee. <laughs> And we can get into that. Well, that we can, we can get into this. that. But at the end of the day, what I mean, first of all, why don't we have a third party candidate? How did no labels implode so badly? It, it's remarkable. I'm, I'm always been a person who believes that politics is driven by the talent of candidates and individual individuals. Like, you know, we always say, well, in the 70s, things were just as bad as they are today. But then Ronald Reagan came and it was morning in America. I was like, well, where's Ronald Reagan? <laughs> 
you need a Ronald Reagan, right? And there's right. no, there doesn't seem to be a Ronald Reagan stay out there waiting to, or at least willing to step in and, and get in the middle and say, you know, is this a private fight or is, can anyone join? To the contrary, <laughs> to the contrary. I mean, your knight in shining armor theory here, it has not, has, I mean, so far hasn't panned out. And every single guest that we've asked, right, who is that guy? Because, you know, individuals can be transformative. Ronald Reagan was in many ways transformative. And we know other individuals who really, you know, single-handedly turned certain things around. You know, Winston Churchill, other great leaders. History Margaret is made Thatcher. great leaders. Right. Yeah. History is and made. elections okay. are. Okay. Who are our candidates? What we see instead is that a lot of the people who we look at as young up-and-comers, oh, we just mentioned Mike Gallagher, but there are others, are leaving politics. They don't want to be the candidate. Nikki Haley didn't want to be a no labels candidate. Yeah. She had a bunch of reasons for it, but she wants a future in the future in the Republican Party. If you could join no labels, you're basically you're, you are got to kill the king or uh, or you're done, right? Well, I'm sorry, but is she going to be the candidate in 2028? I'll she's for it. I, I think she thinks she is because I think she thinks that Donald Trump is going to lose and then she's going to be able to say, say I told you so. But so is Ron DeSantis going to say, I told you so. And a lot of other people who didn't get in are going to say, are going to, are going to jump in. But I mean, truth, no labels was on the ballot, I think, in 19 states already and was had millions and millions of dollars behind it. And all it was looking for, all it needed was somebody to step forward body. and say, I will do it. I mean, more than a warm body, like an actual viable candidate and probably had the only time, uh, I'll be interested in what our guests think of this, but I, I would say the only time in modern American history where a third party would actually have a chance because so many people were unhappy with the choices. Right, we had the co-chairman, Pat yeah. McCrory, of No Labels, uh, who's since, I, I understand, left No Labels, but of course, <laughs> as indeed has everybody, can get everything back except the money. <laughs> this is Washington, folks. But it is inexplicable to me because at that point, right, you only need 35% of the vote. You don't need to actually like you don't need to, you suddenly don't need 50%, you only need the plurality, yeah. or at least in the Electoral College. Well, this is something that we want to ask our guests about, so I guess we, we should stop. We keep saying we're going we to ask, ask our, our guests, guests. So why don't we bring them up so here? So let's bring them up here, if we might. Amy Walter is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter. This is also her second time doing a live it podcast with so us, exciting. for which we are hugely grateful. She's a contributor to the PBS NewsHour, it's, and it's Politics Monday. She's a regular Sunday panelist on NBC News's Meet the Press, where I have seen her. She is awesome, and you all will learn that shortly. No less awesome, Matt Continetti is the Director of Domestic Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, a fine institution, I understand. He's also the inaugural Patrick and Charlene Neal Chair in American Prosperity. Oh, congratulations. That sounds great. Yeah. You are, you. Uh, he is also, I want to add, I, obviously everybody knows editor of the Free Beacon, but author of one of, uh, of, one of our books favorite on books, on really, yeah. called The Right, which if you haven't read it or listened to it as I did at Mark's recommendation, I absolutely commend it to you. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, guys. So, you heard our intro with all the people saying what the hell is going on. That was actually inspired by Donald Trump. And for the first several years, it was all Donald Trump saying what the hell is going on. And then when Biden won, we had to switch it up and bring some Biden and other people into it. What are the chances that we're going to have to go to back to our old intro? Uh, right, right. <laughs> Let's put it that way. You can put them both in there exactly until you wait. I mean, I think you set it up pretty well. You have two unpopular people running against each other. But to me, this is how I look at it. It is true that Joe Biden is much less popular than he was in 2020, and his job approval rating is lower than where Donald Trump was at this point in 2020. Not by a ton, but say Donald Trump was at 44, 45, he's at 40. When I was citing that, I was using the spread between approval and disapproval. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So his, um, his gap. So it's, we know that Biden is less popular. Donald Trump isn't necessarily seen more favorably People don't, didn't suddenly go like, oh, I guess I like him now. But there's this nostalgia for the Trump presidency. Whatever their vision was of what 2020 was or 2019 or 2018, it was a time where they feel the economy was better, things seemed more stable. It's grass is always greener sort of situation. So it's not that Donald Trump himself they are reevaluating. It's the Donald Trump era in terms of their own economic lives or whatever their 
the economic livelihood of the, the country. And so the question is, will that nostalgia last after the Biden campaign spends $50 gajillion reminding people not just of what the Trump presidency was like, but what it will look like if there is a Trump 2.0? That's the gamble. That's what the Biden campaign believes will be the deciding place. It will start to move these numbers back to a more normal place. They see that. And by normal place, meaning that the numbers we're seeing for Trump right now are basically his ceiling and that that's fine. He can be at 46, 47, 48. That's where he was in those swing states in 2020 and in 2016. But we can surpass that, except that you have these third party candidates. Right. So he can win. Trump can without getting a majority of the vote. And that's where the no labels piece comes in. Democrats did a very effective job, I think, of making it very uncomfortable for anyone to take that position as a no labels candidate. Mm -hmm. I think, number one. Number two, the people that they were looking for to take that job were the kinds of political professionals that knew it was impossible to win as a third party candidate, that the math was never going to add up. And so they had to decide if I'm going to be a spoiler, how uncomfortable will it be for me in the future to be known as the person that helped to, in many cases, help Trump to win again. Have we decided this? Is that, that a third party would have helped Trump, Matt? And I also want to ask you about a really fascinating formula, formulation you had in a piece you wrote where you noted we haven't had a two incumbent election since I actually had to look twice because I thought my glasses weren't working since 1892. 1892. Yeah. yeah, don't you guys remember that yeah, race? Yeah, yeah. You don't course, remember the 1892 the infamous Grover, Grover Cleveland? Cleveland versus Benjamin Harrison? Yes. Big race. Yeah. And Cleveland won. Yeah. And this means what in terms of Biden? <laughs> it means a two incumbent election is like the three body problem on Netflix. It's a very strange <laughs> series. You're not sure what to expect. You know, aliens may be involved. There's a very eccentric quality to a two incumbent election as, that just starts with its novelty. I have a slightly different take than Amy. It seems to me that the election is like one of those sculptures that presents one figure if you look at it straight on and then a totally different figure if you look at it from a different angle. If you just look at the election straight on, as you said in the introduction, Mark, it's essentially a toss up. It's a tie. Yeah. These are both extremely unpopular candidates. All of this national polling is within the margin of error. Biden's had a few days of pretty good numbers, but I remember having a conversation with Amy in 2020 or even 2016 where I said, oh, Trump's having a few good days of numbers, and you reminded me, it's all within the margin, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but look at it from a different angle. Look at it from the angle of what's happening in the seven states that will decide the election. And there, well, Trump has a little bit more of an advantage uh, because it's just a case, and there's been some good reporting on this, that the seven states that will decide the election, primarily the states like um, Nevada, uh, have been most affected by the rise in prices during Biden's presidency and have seen the least wage gains during Biden's presidency. And Trump's lead is larger in these swing states than it is nationally. And then you look at it from the angle, too, of the multi-candidate race. And that introduces a whole other element of certainty. So the real question, just with the metrics I've laid out, is do these third-party candidates make it onto ballots or not? If they are on these swing state ballots in November, and if individually or combined they poll above about 3%, I don't see how Joe Biden wins the election. Because if you look historically at the third-party candidacies, going back to 1912, as soon as an independent candidate or a third party breaches about 3%, it's terrible for the in-party. And it just so happens that the in-party right now is President Joe Biden. Does that play the same way? Yes, it's, it's bad for the incumbent. But in this case, we've got two incumbents. I mean, not really, but... but well, well you do. there's a lot of talk the, about the, the, RFK the Jr. One. and who does he pull from more. And look, we're not going to know until Election Day. But I think he and Cornell West, they're clearly making a play for the progressive base that is dissatisfied with Biden on any number of issues, whether you want the kind of the more solidaristic liberalism with some kind of conspiracism that RFK Jr. presents, or if you just want the far left progressivism that Cornell West represents. If you look at RFK Jr.'s vice presidential selection, Ms. Shanahan is not a figure of the right in any way. And if you look at Cornell West's, Professor West's selection, wow, 
Yes. I mean, Indeed, wow. <laughs> that, you that, seen. that is a that is she's quite a character. So, and then of course Dr. Jill Stein, who supped with Vladimir Putin in 2016. Together, all of them, I think, are going to draw from kind of the crunchy left, which thinks that there's no difference between the parties and w- probably might be immune to the $100 million plus that the Biden campaign is going to spend reminding people how much they dislike Donald Trump. Yeah, there's a reason that Democrats have quickly put together an operation designed to undercut RFK with those very same groups. Look, if I'm the Trump campaign, that's exactly what I would do, is I would promote these third-party candidates to disaffected Democrats. And so the Democrats right now, this separate operation, is designed to make sure that RFK Jr. does not become acceptable to these kinds of voters. So again, we'll see. I think you're exactly right, Matt, that first we have to see where he gets on the ballot. But you know what you really do have it's, is, and I think this has been the challenge for Biden for the entirety of his presidency, and quite frankly for the Democratic Party for the last eight years, is that they are the anti-Trump coalition. Their coalition has been put together not really by issues or ideology, but by we stand against Donald Trump and who he is and whatever Trumpism is. And the people showing up to vote are voting against Trump more than Biden. And that's still the case today. I went and I looked back in NBC polling from 2016. Most people who were voting for Donald Trump in 2016 said, well, I'm voting against Hillary, right? Like, I don't know about this Trump guy, but I can't stand her. By the time we got to 2020, 75% of Trump voters were like, no, I'm with Trump. The same has not happened with Biden. He still only has 35, 45, 40, ish percent saying, yeah, I'm showing up because I want to vote for Biden. The majority are still anti-Trump. So if Trump's not the center of the conversation, those voters start to get distracted. And then issues that divide the coalition, like Israel, become a much bigger deal. So Trump has to be at the center if you're the Biden campaign, because that is the energy for your coalition. Yes, you have to be able to say, here's what I'm gonna do, and you gotta tell people more than just, I'm not Trump. But for those people who are saying, I don't know, should I vote, Eh, it doesn't matter. The other fundamental structural problem, so Donald Trump's base is solidly behind him, right? And his problem is with swing voters, and particularly in those seven states that Matt referenced, right? Joe Biden's problem is also with swing voters who are unhappy with him because of inflation and all the other things like that. But he also has a problem with his base. Yeah. And, you know, he's lost, I think, 30 points with black voters since the start of this, since, uh, since he became president, 17 points with Hispanics. There was just a Fox News poll showed that young voters are favoring Trump by, I think, 18 points. That'll probably tighten as you, as you get closer to the election. But still, he's hemorrhaging, you know, votes from his base. And so he has to, as you say, he has to, you know, in order the strategy to go after Kennedy is to reassure the progressive base because they're attacking him from the left. But yeah. the more he does that, the more he alienates the swing voters who are upset about inflation and, and all the economic issues and all, all the rest of it. So how does he get out of that box? Would almost anything he does alienates somebody that he's in trouble with? Well, right. I think that Amy had the answer, which is Donald Trump yeah. Is, yeah. is the Easier way he gets answer. out of that box. I, for a piece I wrote today, I went back to one of my favorite quotes of the past month, which was Biden's campaign advisor, Jen O'Malley Dillon, ran the 20 campaign, worked in the White House. Now she's working in Delaware as part of the 24 campaign. And she said that, you know, I used to believe that job approval rating was correlated with election outcome, but I'm not so sure of that anymore. And a lot of the Biden campaign's theory of the case rests on whether these numbers no longer have any meaningful relationship to one another. And the truth is, there is some evidence to suggest that they don't have a meaningful relationship. Biden has been unpopular since the summer of 2021. And yet, other than the off-year elections in 21, where Republicans scored this great upset with Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, Democrats have been overperforming Biden's approval rating. You know, this past week, I think, has been kind of a lesson uh, in the roller coaster nature of this Mm -hmm. campaign. Mm -hmm. Because on Tuesday, we got the news that the Arizona Supreme Court was invalidating the law passed recently in 2022 with the, I think, 
15 or 12 week limit on abortion and replacing it with the 1864 law that has no exceptions except for life in the mother. And this was like a grenade lobbed into the 2024 campaign. It came right after Donald Trump made his announcement that his new abortion policy is the will of the people, leave it to the states, the will of the people to decide. And of course, when you do that, it means that you're going to be asked about every single policy in every single state. So immediately, Trump was asked, well, do you agree with what just happened in Arizona? Because you think it should be left to the states. So this is a, we can talk about it at length, this is a big political problem for Republicans. What happens 24 hours later? The inflation report comes out for March, showing that inflation has increased in the second month in a row, and that it's nowhere near the Fed target. And now the price level is, everyone is reminded of the 19% increase in overall prices since Joe Biden became president. So which is it, abortion or inflation? Pick your poison. The fact is though. And don't forget immigration. Well, <laughs> but that, well, so this is exactly my point. You list the issues. Trump has more issues on his favor, yeah. right? Inflation, border, crime. Biden has two issues, abortion, Trump, slash democracy, slash J6. January 6th, yeah. Trump has more issues, but what I've seen in the, in the election returns since 21 is that Biden's issues move more votes. And so I'm, I'm not willing to say who's going to win this election because we're, we're testing that theory yeah. of Jen O'Malley Dillon. Yeah, it's, it, that's a really, really good point. And if you look at, and, and then we get to the next theory of why Democrats are doing so well. You know, one theory of the case is, well, they're now overperforming because the Democratic coalition has swapped out low information voters who don't have a, maybe they don't have a college degree or they whatever their income level education level is lower we know that higher income higher education voters tend to vote more consistently those voters used to be republicans they're now democrats they live all in the suburbs of every major city now and the lower propensity less consistent voters are now more Republican, and they're going to show up in a presidential election, which will make these off-year elections make some sense, right? But I do, I do agree that this job approval rating thing, so like, let's look at the last election in 2020. Donald Trump's job approval rating in Gallup was 46, 47 percent. He never hit 50, and he came within 40,000 votes of winning the presidency, right? So, you know, it used to be the rule, if you're under 50 percent, can't win can't win the White House. And then George W. Bush was right around like 49-ish, 48-ish, so was Obama. They were like right at the cusp. Trump, under that, came 40,000 votes of winning. There are a lot of people right now, we saw it in 2022, we're seeing it in the polling right now, a lot of people right now who say, I don't think the economy's doing well. I don't think the president's doing a particularly good job on the economy. But when you ask them, who are you gonna vote for, they still pick Biden over Trump. They are expressing their discontent with Biden, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to vote for him. On this theory, so another Gallup poll, which Gallup does every every four years, is are you better off now than you were right. four years ago? Right. And in October 2020, that number was 56% said they were better off than they were four years ago, which is the highest it's ever been. It was in the middle of the worst pandemic yep. in, in, since, in since, uh, 1918, the worst racial unrest since the 1960s, the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. They still said they were better off now than they were four years ago, but 56% of Americans didn't vote for Donald Trump That's or else right. he'd be president. And it was because the chaos, That's right. right? They were just tired of the chaos. Well, Joe Biden came in and said, I'm going to end the chaos. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to yeah. be a normal president. I'm going to I'm going to work across, across the aisle and work with Republicans, be bipartisan, and bring normalcy back. Do you see less chaos now? Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. We're going to unify the country. We're not going to be as divided. That we're going to lower the temperature. But it's going to be more consistent. War, you know, yeah, war yeah, in Ukraine, I mean. war in the Middle East, yeah, in agree. record inflation, all of that. Yeah. And so, you know, to your point about Trump nostalgia, yes. you know, maybe. I also remember what was happening at the end of 2020. Everybody was getting a check from the government. Yeah. You were getting PPP loans. You were getting child tax credits. You were getting actual just like stimulus checks. So the economy felt better in some ways because, you know, there was that big safety net of government spending. 
once that was gone, now it's plus inflation. There you go. Right. I mean, in 2019, too, we had a full employment economy with no inflation. And I think when people are comparing mm -hmm. the Trump record to Biden, that's the comparison they're making. But to what you're saying, Mark, that's a great argument for a Republican candidate. Unfortunately, that's not the Republican candidates that are running <laughs> for either the presidency or most Senate races. And what's fascinating to me, again, you know, I only think about these things when I have a deadline. But what do we know Donald Trump is promising in his second term? I, I did some thinking and kind of some Googling, and I, I really know only four things. He's going to pardon the J6 hostages. I used air quotes for the podcast audience. He's going to launch the greatest deportation program that America's ever known. He's going to impose a 10% tariff on imports globally and much higher tariffs on Chinese imports, and he's not going to do anything to touch Social Security and Medicare. Those are, I think, the, f and he'll leave abortion to the states for now, though I think he'll end up changing his position by election day. So anyway, so just take those four points right there. Is that the message that you just laid out? No. No, yeah. not at all. And so, again, what is Biden's only real strategy? Make the election about Donald Trump. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I, as the Democratic Party has, I don't think it's drifted. I think it's actually turned reasonably decisively uh, away from, from Israel. And if I can be polemical uh, towards Hamas, I've had a bunch of reporters asking me, so, you know, where's, where's Trump on this? And to your point, uh, I don't know, actually. Well, <laughs> Except for, or Ukraine, except, or, or, Ukraine well, or Ukraine. So on Ukraine, he would make a great deal. On Israel, he just doesn't know how Jews could ever vote for, for Joe Biden. That is what amounts to his Middle East policy. Yeah, I mean, he gave the interview to Hugh Hewitt last week where he was basically, Hugh was desperate for Trump to clarify his position <laughs> and gave him an opportunity. And Trump said it's got to finish the job because Israel is experiencing terrible public relations. Mm -hmm. Now, I happen to agree with both of those things. I think they're empirically true, but it's not a grand strategy for the Middle East. And it's a reminder of what Trump cares about most, above all. How are things playing on TV? And so he's watching television and he's seeing again and again the news coverage of the situation in Gaza and he's saying this is terrible publicity for Israel and so Israel needs to go and finish the war so the region can turn to some type of normalcy. Uh, he doesn't express any ideas for how to get to that point. But and he doesn't even mention Iran. He doesn't mention Iran. Which was a big thing for him. Though, once. you know, he, he did give a speech at the RJC where he's tough on Iran. Look, Trump is not thinking about policy. He wants to give as much room to himself as possible to maneuver should he become president again. And his true imperatives are almost entirely focused, I think, on changing the government. Revenge for the prosecutions against him that are now threatening his personal liberty. And then changing the nature of the bureaucracy mm -hmm. so that he won't be stymied by the deep state in a second term. Well, yay. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me follow up. I mean, you, you said, and n normally, you know, as much as I care about foreign policy, I always tell our listeners the same thing, which is very few people vote on this issue. But as you said, when, when you have this sort of balance, this parity between them, suddenly issues like Israel become important. Right. So, I mean, we have, we, we in foreign policy, we, the grand we in foreign policy have all been saying, okay, well, you know, the turn on Israel is about Michigan. It's about uh, appealing to disgruntled voters. But I mean, it will, will will this it? matter? <clears throat> will the uncommitted votes, will the right. whatever they are called, uh, what, you know, in, in in Nevada, will those matter? We don't know. I mean, they they will matter, and maybe they won't matter. It's been clear for a long time the numbers that you all have cited since we started about the dissatisfaction within the Democratic base for Biden. Whether that is the deciding factor for them to show up and vote third party to stay home or to vote for Donald Trump. Now, I think most of those folks know that they're not voting for Donald Trump. I do think the staying home is a very big factor and potentially throwing a vote to a third party, though I don't think, you're, you're not seeing RFK Jr. lean in on this, right? If you really wanted to be the, I'm gonna win over these voters who have skepticism about Biden and I'm the progressive candidate. He's not that candidate. He has, I was just listening to Sarah Longwell interview Ested Herndon from the New York Times about the interview that Ested did with RFK Jr. And his point was, you know, RFK Jr. cares really about one thing and it's the vaccine issue. That is his whole campaign. All this other stuff is not that interesting to him. So and those are Trump voters. Those are right. And so you get into, well, who's a, who's a vaccine voter? 
right? Is he going to now start pulling some Trump people? And now you've seen the news that now the Trump campaign saying, uh, maybe we should do something about this RFK Jr. thing. Like maybe we should start paying attention to this as a potential threat for our base, people who are maybe getting a little soft on Trump. So when the race for the White House comes down to, yeah, 50,000 people in three states, you tell me what's going to move them to stay home or to show up or to vote a different way. Well, since Danny and I are both foreign policy wonks, let me follow up on the foreign policy question. Mark Penn's Harvard-Harris poll came out the other day, and it had what I thought was a devastating statistic for Biden, which is that 54 percent of Americans believe he's making decisions on the Israel-Hamas war out of domestic political consideration rather than what's best for Israel and the world and for American foreign policy. That's the kind of stuff that really hurts. And so is it smart tactically for him to be pandering to this 5% of the electorate in Michigan when doing so, one, I'm sure there's, I think there's at least 100,000 Jewish voters in Michigan and in Pennsylvania. in Pennsylvania and other states. And people see it as it feeds the caricature, caricature not caricature, because it's actually, I think it's true, but the image of, of him as weak, weak on the world stage. And it shows weakness to pander to a, to a group of voters in that way. Uh, when, when you have a long record of being one of the most pro-Israel, you know, voices in Washington. Well, of the three states in the you know, the so-called blue wall, right, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, that Donald Trump won in 2016, first Republican to do so since 1988, then loses in 2020. Michigan is where Trump has been performing the best. Wisconsin is very close. Pennsylvania, very close as well. Michigan, Trump has a little bit more of a lead. So Biden has to do everything he can to win Michigan. When you're in a situation as a politician where you've already really kind of turned off the independent voters, and you're losing support in the middle, well, you're gonna to have to shore up your base. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you also lose your base. Then you're really stuck with no one. In fact, that's what happened to George W. Bush at the end of his presidency. He had lost the independent voters and then some of his moves between immigration and the uh, financial crisis, they all abandoned him uh, in the Republican base and he was left with a very low approval rating. Biden doesn't wanna be there. He's already, as you said, extremely unpopular. He's already presided over an increase in the price level. The only president in recent times who has presided over a similar increase in the price level is Jimmy Carter, one-term president. So he has to do something to retain the base or at least prevent that part of the electorate from deciding, you know what, Biden is helping Israel commit genocide and Trump, not the biggest supporter of the Muslim community, I'm just gonna stay home on election day. But this, but this is the trap that I was talking about. So what would really help him in Michigan? Pull back on the climate craziness because he didn't stop pushing these EVs, which are putting all the auto workers out. If you do that, but, you alienate the green group. Exactly, but that's important. my point. So his ba- he, he, <laughs> I think he, we're making the same point. Yes, I know. We are. Everybody has to pander to the marginal voters. But, I mean, that's, that's not entirely abnormal. I want to come back to talking about Donald Trump. <laughs> 91 indictments. Uh, did... Is that minus the four that got thrown out? Or? Well, there are four indictments, 91 counts. 91 counts. Sorry. It's so easy to be confused. Let's, let's get you know? it straight here. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Donald Trump. I know you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> These trials are coming up notwithstanding his increasingly frenetic efforts to deny them. Suing the judge, I find, is always an excellent strategy, just in case you, you know, lose. <laughs> and things don't go your way, but are they gonna make a difference? I honestly, I have no idea. I've seen arguments on both sides. What do you think? What do you think? I think they will make some difference in this way. Uh, The New York hush money trial starts and Trump could be in a situation where he is basically off the campaign trail for four days a week. And- Does he have to, he has to attend? Federal, federal, absolutely. Yeah, he has to be there. He has to be there. So this presents logistical challenges for the Trump campaign. Now, you know, there is a certain frenetic quality to him that, you know, he might be able to do some type of events or on the weekends, he might have to give up golf and (laughs) campaign there. You go too far. (laughs) Right. There's some places he won't go, right? He won't give up the round of golf. So I do think it presents a challenge for him campaigning. On the other hand, it, it will prevent him from doing things that might remind the median voter of the unsavory parts of his presidency while reinforcing among his own voters 
and people who are not necessarily in his base who also believe this, that he, has been, he is the subject of political prosecution, that he has been railroaded by the Biden Justice Department and by progressive prosecutors. And so he has earned, I think, quite a bit of sympathy because of his legal situation. And the trials will remind the people who feel such sympathy of, of their connection to him. So I mean, the interesting part, too, is you have a president who can't really or either doesn't want to or believes he can't really lean in on this. Right? Because if you said to me, hi, you're running a campaign, Mark, and the person you're running against has 91 indictments, or four counts of 91 indictment, indictments, what do you want to talk about on the campaign? You'd be like, uh, aren't we going to talk about the indictments? Aren't we going to talk about the fact that my, while I'm out here doing the presidenting, my opponent is literally in a courtroom? Don't you think that's what you'd want to talk about? But because it is so unpredictable where that goes, it does help him, I think, raise money, raise attention from his base and support from his base. I think for, some, for so many swing voters, you guys talked about this as the rematch that nobody wanted, and I think that's fair. Good 20 to 30% of Americans say they dislike both equally. Those voters are completely checked out of this because they don't want to pay attention to it. And it's like kind of white noise, right? Oh, he's Trump's in court, great. I don't know if that's good or bad for Trump that it's getting called the hush money payment versus the election overturning, right? Are people just like, oh, it's a porn star? Whatever, I'm checking out of that. Versus, oh, it's January 7th. We really are, we are, we are in territory we have not been before and so, I don't know that, again, normally I would say... Grover Cleveland a, wasn't under indictment. Gro right, right, Grover Cleveland wasn't sitting <laughs> no. in a courtroom every day with cameras on him. So every day it's, you know, here's the latest development in the Donald Trump trial. I mean, one, one thing that should be added, too, is it's not as if Biden is the most active campaigner. Right. I so we have this, what, we have this weird, uh, so much about this election is just weird. It's, 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 it's one of the longest <laughs> general elections in modern memory. The general election will last longer than, than the Major League Baseball season. The two nominees were determined before opening day, and the last game of the World Series is scheduled to end, if it goes to game seven, on the weekend before election day. So the general election is going to be one of the longest we can remember. At the same time, the two candidates will do the least amount of campaigning mm -hmm. because Trump will be in court and Biden, you know, he keeps very strict hours. And I've always thought that one reason why he's doing so well in Pennsylvania is he goes there every weekend on the way back home to Delaware. You know, but he's not going, but they brought him out to Wisconsin this week, but he's not the most active campaigner because of his age. How do the trials affect the whole referendum question? So, I mean, Joe Biden wants this to be a referendum on Trump. Trump should want, if, if, it's, yeah. a, if it's a referendum on Biden, Biden loses. Yeah. If it's a referendum on Trump, Trump loses, <laughs> right? And so Joe Biden wants it to be a referendum no on Trump, and Trump, <laughs> and Trump wants it to be a referendum on Trump because Trump likes when we talk about Trump, right? How do the trials affect who this is a referendum on? Because we're gonna be spending a lot of time talking about Donald Trump and what he did after the election and his personal life and all the thing, all the chaos stuff we were talking about before that was why the 56% didn't all vote for Trump. Is this hurt him from that perspective? And what are we talking about the two weeks before the election? I mean, for if you have this significant group of people who are either disaffected Biden, and we talked about the Michigan voters, disaffected Biden voters, you've got the 20, 25% who don't like either candidate. And then you've got just regular swing voters. These are normal people who are living their lives and they're not paying attention to politics. They don't wake up every day putting on a red or a blue jersey. They're just doing their thing. They're gonna check in late in the campaign, in part because that's what they normally do, but in part because they don't like their choices. This is not an inspiring experience for them. So what are we talking about in October? Are we still talking about Israel? What is the story on inflation? What is the story on the border? What has happened in these trials? What happened, right? Uh, that, so if what happened in Arizona came down, just imagine the Arizona case or the IVF case coming down in early October. That's a very different conversation we're having going into the election than if we get another, the latest consumer price index. You aren't, you're not crazy, America. It is true, it costs more money at the grocery store. You know? So 
Before we uh, turn to our audience, and, I, uh, and we are going to do that, we're all obsessing about the presidential election, and it's been all the questions we've asked. But of course, we do have a, a Congress that apparently does nothing every single freaking day. <laughs> but that's another problem. But Karl Rove had a great piece in the Wall Street Journal, mostly based on the co political report. Unfortunately, it printed out, as Mark said, looking like Sanskrit. So I'm trying to decipher what he said. But in large part, he noted I, it did. <laughs> I, for the record, I'm showing everybody it looks like Sanskrit. But it noted that there are actually more Democratic retirements from the House than Republican retirements, even though that's all we've been talking about. Noted that a lot of them are actually from swing districts, whereas most of the Republicans retiring are from pretty solid districts. So in fact, the conventional wisdom, and I think it is the conventional wisdom in this town right now, is that is that Republicans are yeah. going to lose the House? Yeah. And Carl's like, well, they may not, they may not succeed in losing the House, which I think is phrasing it exactly right. What do you guys think about both the House and the Senate, where the CW is slightly leaning in the opposite direction? Yeah. So if you look at our House readings at the Cook Political Report, you'll see there are only 22 races that we consider toss-ups. So of 435 races, probably comes down to about 25 when all is said and done. For Democrats to win just the barest majority, they have to win about 70% of those. For Republicans to hold, they have to win 35%. So what do you, it's easier 35%, but to your point, you can also mess up, right? It's like, a, it's kicking the extra point. Can you miss export? Absolutely, do it all the time. So candidate quality, fundraising, what's going on on the top of the ticket in your state, a lot of these battleground house districts are taking place outside of battleground presidential or Senate. New York, California, Oregon. To me, my favorite district may be Nebraska too, where, right, the one electoral college vote, so lots of money going into Omaha and a very competitive House race. But that's, so I do think the House is an absolute toss up. I think it is way too soon to say, oh yeah, Democrats have it. I don't feel that way at all. The Senate is just to say decidedly uphill for Democrats is kind of putting it politely. Just think of it this way, Joe Manchin's open seat in West Virginia, it's going to Republicans. So let's just get that out of the way. So we now have a 50-50 Senate. If Trump wins, it's done. The, the majority flips. For Democrats to hold the Senate, Biden has to win, and they have to hold seven very competitive states, including Ohio, Montana, that Trump will win, maybe by double digits, but certainly by high single digits in Ohio. And then also hold on to Michigan and Arizona and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. So could it and happen? Maryland. Sure. And Maryland. Maryland is and now, and now Maryland is on the map. It's not as competitive as those others, but it's certainly getting, it's much more interesting. It's not, it was totally unexpected. I was always skeptical of the conventional wisdom that the House would go to the Democrats simply because since uh, Bill Clinton, every incoming president has come in with a unified Congress. So George W's was messed up when Jim Jeffords defected to the Democratic Party and then they had to wait until after the 2002 election to regain the Senate control. But Biden had, of course, what turned out to be a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate as well as the Democratic House. And Trump came in with the trifecta in 2016. So it makes sense to me that if Trump wins, then he will have full control of the government once more. At the same time, one of the, again, weird aspects of this election is you can see almost every potential partisan configuration of the two elected branches. You have weird situations where you could have, could have a status quo election, but you could also have an election where Biden is the president with the Republican House and the Republican Senate, where Trump is the president with the Democratic House and the Republican Senate. So you could have uh, three different flips among the, the two branches, the two houses in Congress, the two chambers of Congress, or you could have none. But I tend to be where Amy is. I think the Senate is almost certainly going to the Republicans and the House is very much competitive, but the slight Republican edge. This is a live podcast and we've got an audience here, so we're gonna do something we don't normally get to do and take some questions from our audience. Right over there. Thank you, uh, Christian Forsten, Hans Seidel Foundation. So if you frame it like um, the rematch, nobody wanted. So how did the two candidates <laughs> got nominated? Yeah? Second, <laughs> so why, why this change of generation yeah, not happening? That's a question I usually get as a European living in Washington. Mm -hmm. Second question, do you think there will be still a replacement, which is legally possible? And maybe a third question, yeah, what would you recommend 
candidate Donald Trump to uh, nominate as uh, vice president? Oh, that's Great question. a good question. I did, yeah. And we didn't come to that. There's a lot of questions there. And how did the two, uh, so how did the parties select their nominees? Here. You know, it's not quite true to say no one wanted these two candidates. There are a lot of Republicans who wanted Donald Trump. And they were slightly depressed after the 22 midterm result and after the low point uh, of many low points where he was dining with two anti-Semites at Mar-a-Lago in November of 2022. But because of the indictments, he began to regain strength. And the MAGA movement, uh, the Make America Great America Again movement is very powerful. And so they wanted Trump to be the nominee. With Biden, it's just very hard to unseat an incumbent president. The choice is really up to him. Would he be like a Lyndon Johnson and announce that because of his age and because he wanted to transition to a new generation of leadership, he would only serve one term. He chose not to do that. Whether it's still possible to make a switch, I am very skeptical. I think these, this is the, these are the two nominees, and this is the vice presidential nominee on the Democratic side. So on the Republican side, I have no idea who he's going to pick. <laughs> Uh, there are a lot of different, I don't think he has any idea who he's going to pick because from what I understand, everyone who comes into contact with him is asked by Donald Trump, who should I pick for vice president? Who do you think I should pick? I have a, there are a lot of different choices. There's everything from Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. Trump has always wanted to capture a sizable portion of the African-American vote. Black men in particular, as Mark was saying, seem much more receptive to voting for Donald Trump than they have for a Republican candidate in 60 years. That's a possible avenue. He is being told by the MAGA forces that J.D. Vance of Ohio would make the great pick. I was picked up on this uh, by rereading a, an op-ed that his advisor, Kellyanne Conway, wrote earlier this year. She kind of laid out all the different options. There was only one choice who appeared multiple times in her op-ed, and that was Marco Rubio. I thought that was very interesting. On the other hand, Kellyanne Conway was also telling Donald Trump to embrace a limit with exceptions on abortion at the federal level so his position would be defined by him and not by the Democrats, and he rejected her advice. So maybe he won't be listening to Kellyanne on the day that he chooses as vice president, in which case it's not Marco. I do have one dark horse, though, and that is Glenn Youngkin. I think that if he chose Youngkin, it would unify the party in a way that would be very productive for Donald Trump. The only problem would be he doesn't like sharing the spotlight yeah. very much, and also Yunkin is taller than he is. <laughs> <laughs> These but things matter. You never yeah. know. You that, never know. That, that would be a Haley-esque choice. choice. It would without be without Haley. Haley. Yes. Yeah. And Yunkin has been he endorsed pretty early. He endorsed right around Iowa. So, and he has kept a pretty good relationship with Trump. And he would certainly reassure all of the more establishment, business interest type Republicans who still remain in the party. Do you have a vote, Amy? I agree with everything that Matt said. And yes, I think his desire to have somebody who not only won't take away from his spotlight, but who does not have any other ambition than to be unflailingly loyal makes this decision even harder. Remember, you're talking about a, a guy who would be going into his final term, 77 years old. If you are picked to be the vice president, what is the first thing you're thinking about? Oh, great, I'm going to go run in 28. <laughs> well, not if you're Trump's vice president. You can't be doing anything that has any hint that you are interested and being anything other than the vice president, number two to his number one. Number two to his number one is the best put I've heard it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> over here. I can't see you guys, by the way, so I apologize. Wave your arms uh, aggressively. Hi. Um, where do you see Nikki Haley voters going? Well, uh, I think one, the first question we have to ask is, who are the Nikki Haley voters? So Nikki Haley about, attracted about a fifth of the vote in, uh, in the places where she did the best. Even after she dropped out, she was still pulling about 20 percent. The question is, who are these people? Are they Republican voters? Or are they independent voters or even Democrats who are just so anxious to vote for against Donald Trump that they will participate in Republican primaries in order to do so? Regardless of what the breakdown of that figure is, I do think it presents some challenges for Trump. Nikki Haley did best in the places where Trump is weakest, and that is the, sub the suburbs, and that is the, the among moderate voters, moderate Republican voters, and 
more centrist voters. And the fact is, and this is something that, you know, Amy and I have been talking about throughout Trump's presidency and beyond, he does not care about those voters at all. He does nothing ever to try to appeal to those voters. With Trump, it is, you are with me, and if you're with me, then I will reward you. But if you're not with me, I'm not good. Outreach is not really in Donald Trump's vocabulary. And so it's a real question where they fall in November. They may be part of this large mass of voters that just looks at the, cho the choices and says, I'm not participating in this. This is, I just, let, let somebody else figure it out. I'm going to stay home. If that happens, it could hurt both candidates, in all honesty. Yeah. Because usually that's where elections are decided, in yeah. the suburbs. Yeah. I mean, the, for Biden, a Trump 2020 voter who decides to stay home is essentially a vote for Biden. So that's fine. Whether they show up for him or they stay home is a, is a big deal. But I think it was Nate Cohn over at the New York Times. I also saw somebody else digging into the Georgia voter file after the Georgia primary. Remember, it, Nikki Haley had dropped out by then, but she was still getting this phantom vote, right? 18, 19%. Some of them have voted before she dropped out. But when you sort of match up who those voters are who voted for Nikki Haley or showed up and voted in the primary, a lot of people who showed up and voted were people who voted like in the 2020 Democratic primary or who we know that it's not that they were plants necessarily, no. this idea like, oh, they went in just to embarrass Trump. No, they may be at one point consider them, and maybe they still consider themselves Republican, but not a Trump Republican. So there is still a slice of that electorate out there. And I think the, the gamble that Trump has always been making is that he can win without those swing voters because he's going to pick up the voters who don't traditionally show up to, for other politicians, but who show up for him, which we saw in 2016 and in 2020. And now he, this debate about the realigning of Latino and black voters, he's going to win over enough from those groups that he doesn't need that swing vote. But again, those voters are consistent voters. They are voters that show up election after election. You can be more confident in that they're gonna show up. You're not gonna necessarily be confident that those who don't normally, I was reading, for example, this, I guess it was the Wall Street Journal poll today or yesterday about black voters who are defecting from Biden, but when they interviewed one of them, you know, it's like, yeah, things were better when Trump was there and Biden's a disappointment. You know, Mr. So-and-so did not vote in 2020, right? So if you didn't vote in 2020, mm -hmm. which had the highest turnout in American history, are you really going to show up in 2024? Really? So that's why looking at all this data, we have more data than ever, but I don't think, and Matt said it perfectly, it's not necessarily giving us answers. It's just giving us a different way to look at the structure so you can make it anything you want. But if this race comes down to, as these last few races for control of Congress and president have come down to literally thousands of votes out of millions cast, I, I just, I think you have to <laughs> just maybe a little humility about where, where things are headed. Let's take one last question from the audience. You're Klaus Laris from the Wilson Center. Can you briefly talk about the vice president? Why do the Democrats not try to build her up more? And would it not help Biden if uh, he was seen as having a very popular, very competent uh, vice president who could succeed him? Do you want to quote Don Rumsfeld here? You, you, go, to, you go to war you, with the army, army you have? have. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do think that Vice President Harris is taking a more of an affirmative role in the campaign. Uh, she's been traveling much more frequently. She is is really emphasizing issues on abortion access. She's trying to build out the support among young voters in particular. She's also been much more progressive, let's say, in her rhetoric when it comes to the Middle East. So she's definitely being typecast as the outreach to the progressive base. Yep. And I think she's done a, actually a pretty good job in recent weeks in not committing a, any major gaffes. That was not the case for the first three years of Biden's presidency. So I actually think right now the Biden campaign is pretty okay with Vice President Harris. It might be interesting, I don't know, you know, we have this whole question of whether Biden and Trump will debate. I'm of the view that they will not. Mm. That doesn't necessarily mean the vice presidential candidates won't debate. 
That would be an interesting kind of thing, because either one of those vice presidential candidates has not an insignificant chance to be the president in the next four years. So that would actually be a more interesting a more debate. Yeah, debate. And, uh, you don't think the, the Trump-Biden debates are, are going to happen? Why? I, I, I think that there's very little in it for either one of them. If I was advising Trump, I'd tell him to show up to the vice presidential debate and say, she's the real gander, and I'll, I'll debate her, too. Yeah, I mean, Trump <laughs> is calling for a debate. The Biden folks have been very reluctant to say definitively that they're going to yeah. debate. Not quite sure it's actually in Trump's interest to debate. But, you know, we keep, uh, Amy made the excellent point that a lot, I think, so much will depend on what happens in the final days of the election. On the other hand, by, by mid-October, late October of 2020, yeah. what, 50% of exactly. votes had been exactly. cast? Arizona, and yeah, you know, these so, states that are mostly vote by mail. And a lot of those early votes were, I think, a lot of them were shaped by the, the worst week of Trump's presidency, which was the first debate with Biden, which mm -hmm. devolved into the shouting match, and then Trump getting COVID, and the way that he reacted to his COVID diagnosis, and the, you know, the hospital stay, and then him coming back on the helicopter, and you know, him mm -hmm. leaking to the New York Times that he wanted to open up his shirt and revealing the Superman logo underneath when he returned to the White House. So, uh, so you, you know, it, is it necessarily in Trump's interest to debate in <laughs> September of October? Right yeah. Now. yeah, so I I, 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 that's days. kind of my view. Yeah, but, that's a great Well, let's, let's close with a, with a game, because you guys have both been on Special Report with Brett Baer, so I'm just going to steal the, the game from Candidate Casino. It's uh, Election Day, November. You got $100 in chips. Who are you putting it on? Oh. <laughs> well, I have a new uh, candidate She's casino strategy. What's that? Which is, I just go for the upside. So it's $100 on Trump. If I win, uh, maybe I'll make a little bit of money. And if I lose, it's all fake money anyway. So. Oh, that is, that is an excellent way to do that. OK. Um, look, Trump is ahead right now. And I, I don't think that's a mirage or that you know polling's broken or whatever. This is, right now, about Joe Biden, and that's and there's this nostalgia for Trump. So he, I don't know if I, I wouldn't put whatever. I'd like that it's fake money. So sure, why not do that? <laughs> but I would certainly give him the advantage right now. To me, it's it's really like all right. Once we get into this thing, the once the campaign really starts, and when does the campaign really start? Is this race shifting at all to be more about the former incumbent than the current? Do you have what? Do you have a vote here, Ma? Where's your money going? Yeah. Um, Not that I don't know. <laughs> I, I, right now, I'd put it on Trump, but, uh, but as Amy has said, I, so much can change, and so many things can happen between now and October. How about you, Danny? I put it on Biden. Wow. Yeah. Well, there and, you and, go. And, and, and the, the numbers the are same with thing. you. If because you're wrong, you it, don't lose any that's money. That's right. And <laughs> sure, the, sure. The, the, the betting markets. Yeah, right now, where predict they are. it has Biden. Oh, it does. Yeah, he moved up ahead uh, a little bit. I didn't even know that. I will only add this one caveat. I'm always wrong. <laughs> can we I can add, attest to that after 250 episodes. <laughs> never, never one to, to, to be averse to taking a low blow, Mark Thiessen. But no low blows for all of you. First of all, thank you. Thank you to the two of you for joining us. It really, I, I wasn't exaggerating. It has been really one of the pleasures of I, at least my and maybe Mark's professional life. We can't really speak to that. <laughs> to do this podcast and to have people uh, like you and our listeners uh, as part of it. There is is a prize at the end of this uh, for those with us. Uh, please take a mug and use it regularly and so you can stare at Mark's and my beautiful faces every morning with your coffee. And uh, let us thank our producer, Ben. If Clara is here, our former producer, there she, I, is. Uh, there she is, who was with us for, uh, for, for many long episodes, and, and all of you, thanks so very much. Thank you. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.